A few days before the 2019 general election, Steve Coogan, a comic actor most famous for his character Alan Partridge, said on British television that Partridge was ignorant, like Brexit voters. For the past three years, Coogan has steered his creation in a more political direction, using Partridge as a representation of what he thinks is the conservative Brexit voting middle-aged gammon, to use the Remainer pejorative. But Partridge was never meant to be a grotesque version of Britain. He was, foremost, a grotesque version of a B-list celebrity, famous for not showing any discernible talent and indicative of the swathes of media also rans that populate radio and television. Partridge thought of himself as media class, way above the riff-raff and rabble, and somehow on a level playing field with other celebrities, except for the international movie stars such as Roger Moore, somebody Partridge worshipped and wanted to be. The origins of the character were in two new spoof series, On the Hour, made for radio, and its TV incarnation, The Day to Day. In it, Alan Partridge was the resident sports reporter, a man prone to on-air gaffes, twisted metaphors and convoluted commentary on a variety of sports. Among a, amongst a cast of pastiche representations of TV journalists, each with increasingly ludicrous names, such as Kalasili Sisters and Peter Ohanrahanrahan, Partridge had a name and a look that grounded him in reality. His look, mannerisms and voice resembled veteran TV presenters such as David Vine, Gordon Burns and, most obviously, Michael Rodd. The Partridge character at this stage showed a desperate need to be accepted, both by his peers on the show and by the audience as he stared at the camera and begged the audience to join me. He was routinely ridiculed by the senior news anchor Chris Morris as being thick or ignorant compared with the rest of the journalists on the show. Only the truly incompetent and insipid Peter Ohanrahanrahan came in for more stick. But Alan Partridge became the breakout character from the show. Devoid of the stylized surrealism of the other characters, he could fit a number of other formats, and he had a follow-up solo hit show called Knowing Me, Knowing You. In this, Partridge became an evening talk show host in the vein of Wogan. The trick to the show's success is that Partridge ended up making it all about himself. The character had barely concealed contempt for his guests, not helped by his production crew often ill-informing him of who he was meant to be interviewing. Partridge would blunder his way through interviews, often insulting his guests or displaying his ignorance. At times he was mocked by them and on one occasion he accidentally killed one of them. Partridge's personality developed during the series from the mediocre sports reporter with a penchant for bizarre metaphors he became an odious and contemptible character who felt superior to everyone around him. In Partridge's view, by virtue of having his own talk show on TV, complete with a studio band, he was automatically superior to everyone, including his guests. The character changed formats again with the show I'm Alan Partridge, considered by many to be the definitive incarnation of Alan. Here, Alan is without any TV work and his talk show is considered a disaster. After a bitter divorce from his wife, Alan is living in a motel and helming a 4am radio show in Norwich. He still has delusions of grandeur even though the public hate him. TV won't have anything to do with him and he has no friends outside of an ex-forces handyman at the motel who may or may not be suffering from PTSD. But Alan maintains a facade of the celebrity and is obsessed with brand names whilst looking down at everybody around him. He has a recurring dream of him lap dancing in a leather codpiece to a BBC executive and deep down he knows the truth about his non-status whilst outwardly pretending he's still a big name in the entertainment industry. This extends into the second series of I'm Alan Partridge where his status has marginally improved. He has the breakfast slot on Radio Norwich, albeit at the expense of a previous DJ, a game show on a digital TV channel, and an autobiography about how he overcame the setbacks of his life, which included an addiction to eating Toblerone. However, the show is filled with little clues as to how little his life has actually improved. His new, his new home is half built and he's living in a caravan. His star power is still minimal. He has a Russian girlfriend who he clearly doesn't like and his book isn't selling. His attempts to build a new production company for himself fails dramatically as well. As for the public, 
they've gone from antipathy to just not caring about him. After series two, the character went on hiatus as Coogan tried his hands with other characters and in movies. But after nothing quite hit the spot, he returned to Alan Partridge, and this time with two new writers on board, Neil and Rob Gibbons, to provide a new angle on the character. Before, Alan was a youngish man who dressed and looked like a throwback to 70s TV presenters, an old man before his time. The Gibbons twisted things around to make Alan a man in late middle age, pretending to have a bit of youthful invigoration. His manner of dress, dress changed. He became more flippant and less uptight, but there was still that contempt for everyone around him. Alan returned in a format called Mid-Morning Matters with Alan Partridge, which was entirely set in a radio studio during one of his show. He gained a sidekick and the other actors played studio guests or callers on his show. It was pure convoluted Partridge, with his presenting style carrying the comedy instead of the situational jokes. Along with the new series came a mock biography, I, Partridge, We Need to Talk About Alan, which tied all the strands of the character's life and career hitherto seen or referenced into one book. There was the movie Alan Partridge, Alpha Papa, which was very situational and saw Alan as an accidental hero in a hostage situation. Latterly, Alan starred in a mockumentary about the state of Britain in the 21st century called Scissor Dial. In it, Alan tries to insinuate himself into the lives of those who he thinks represents Britain today, from a free gun to checkout girls in a supermarket. The most recent Alan show has been This Time, an attempt to combine the Knowing Me, Knowing You format with the behind-the-scenes personal shenanigans from I'm Alan Partridge. The Alan Partridge character is nearly 30 years old, but it has remained popular because of the finely detailed performance of Steve Coogan and the way the character can fit so many different formats. When Coogan states that Ag Alan is ignorant like Brexit voters, and given his disdain for anyone who voted to leave or voted Conservative, he has forgotten what Alan has represented all along, a caricature of minor celebrity and the sneering contempt the media class has for the public at large. Anyone who isn't in the business automatically earns Alan's contempt unless they can display some characteristic he admires, usually military power, prowess, as evidenced by Michael, the closest thing he has to a friend during the entire Alan oeuvre. Alan occupies a nebulous place in society. Disliked by the public and untrusted by the media, Alan finds it hard to fit in anywhere and is only ever happy when in front of a camera or a microphone. In the I Partridge book, he waxes lyrical about how he was born to broadcast, whether people want to listen to him or not. His sports reporting was non-stop commentary. He can't never let any action speak for without itself. talking about the pedestrianisation of Norwich City Centre and access to Dixons, or the recommendations in Top Gear magazine. Alan isn't a somewhere, despite the Norfolk setting of most of his shows. Norwich is merely the only place that will have him. He lusts for the chance to return to London in the big time. Alan is not someone connected to the British people and its values. He's petty and self-absorbed, a man who wants sponsorship so he doesn't have to pay for anything himself. It's nebulous to suggest that he's either pro or anti-Brexit. It's whatever position will give him the most attention and freebies. Partridge's status between the would-be media personality and a member of the petty bourgeois mirrors Steve Coogan's own no-man's-land status between admired TV comedy actor and would-be Hollywood movie star. Coogan's tried his hand at both, and Partridge is still his crowning achievement, whilst his movie career is usually as a supporting actor in a number of misfiring comedies. Ironically, the only character which has come close to matching Alan Partridge in terms of success is the stylized version of himself in the movie A Cock and Bull Story and its subsequent spin-off series The Trip. Coogan plays himself, a vain, underachieving movie star who is worried his career is in decline and is keen to distance himself from his most famous creation. Not helping him along the way is his supposed best friend, Rob Brydon playing himself. Coogan acts the star, with Brydon always snapping at his heels. On the surface, Bryden is self-assured and constantly undermines Coogan by out-impressioning him in front of other people. Whilst Coogan cares deeply about what other people think about him, 
Rob seemingly doesn't care. Deep down, however, what prompts Rob's teasing is jealousy. That Rob is the slightly superior impressionist and comedy actor, but he's living in Coogan's shadow. What links the stylized Coogan in these shows and Partridge is a disdain for others. Both characters are convinced a higher status is their due, and the bitterness they feel and direct at others has grown out of frustration at a world that won't put them at that status. The incarnation of Coogan in the trip is the person who berates the great British public. In Scissored Isle, Alan comes to look up to the checkout girls by aping their manner of speaking, and it's at this point where it feels like Alan's completed his story arc. By immersing himself in the lifestyle of another group and enjoying himself, Alan no longer feels the need to prove his superiority over them, which is why this time feels like an attack on, a superfluous entry into the Partridge saga. That show is trying to recapture an Alan that was long ago. However, Steve Coogan is still playing out his character from The Trip and Cock and Bull Story in real life. One feels that this character still has mileage, although not in a way that encourages people to laugh along with him. When Coogan speaks of Alan now as a representative of modern Leave Voting Britain, he's forgotten that the character was never, never a representation of that British public. He was always an outsider, an odd fit, a man whose tastes were ever so out of sync with everybody else. Alan was always thought European as well, specifically Scandinavian products were a mark of superiority in his mind. Pog and Pole, Bang and Olufsen, and quintessentially Abba. He had a loathing of farmers and a bizarre on-off fascination with transsexuals. Alan is part of that pantheon of British comedy grotesques. Basil Fawlty, David Brent, Frank Spencer and Victor Meldrew. None of them are indicative of the wider population at large and that contrast with the average British archetype provides the humorous conflict that drives the comedy in their respective shows. Coogan's problem now is that he's parted spiritual company with Alan, even though he still performs as him. The Coogan fretting over his status whilst eating in fine restaurants is the comic creation he's connected to the most right now.